So um, obviously we're, we're uh, in a sort of interesting environment at the moment. The, the one thing that sort of jumped out at me this week was the contrast between the results of City of London and Murray Income. So I'm going to spend some time looking at that. And then Richard's going to look at what's going on with Smooth Supermarket REIT and LXI, um, because there's a, a story there. Obviously, this has been the week of rate rises. We've seen a lot of them around the world, um, with a US rate rise of 75 basis points and 50 here in the UK. Um, I suppose the, the big news was um, Jerome Powell, the chairman of the US Federal Reserve, saying, that um, basically implying that he thought was a rest recession was probably um, inevitable and that wouldn't stop him trying to choke off inflation. Um, and that sent markets down a little bit. Um, but the, for us, I suppose, the big news at the moment is the, the budget, what's going on there. And especially in terms of what looks to be quite a big tax kind of giveaway um, without any balancing income, although I haven't to be fair, I watched all of it because I've been doing this. Um, this is where the markets were um, close to play last night. The UK, I think, we're down about 1.5% again today. Um, something that I was write, writing about recently, people just don't like the UK at the moment for obvious reasons. Um, and it is one of the most shorted markets around the world, even ahead of what was going on today. So we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. Um, anyway, Murray Income versus City of London. I was saying it's all about the contrast here. There's, there's a big 11.5% gap between their NAV returns for the 12 months at the end of June. The gap in share price times isn't quite as stark um, because somehow Murray managed to um, narrow its discount. But um, <clears throat> nevertheless, it's still sitting on discount. And while City of London is on a premium, as you can see here, so that's on a 1.8% premium. Marine is on an 8.4% discount. City of London yields more. It's got lower ongoing charges. It's bigger and more liquid, although they're both of them are two big liquid funds, which is one of the reasons why we're talking about them now. Um, if you remember, when we were talking about the, the upcoming merger of Murray Income and Petrol Income and Growth, we were saying it was going to create a billion pound company. Um, the fact that it's only 918 million now shows you just what's been going on, I think, with, with markets since then. Nevertheless, it, it is definitely worth looking at. In terms of returns, uh, here they are here. Uh, there's an awful lot of numbers on that page, though. Um, although you can see there, obviously, that the last year has been much better. Um, and actually, over the longer term, they kind of matched each other. Here's a five-year chart that just charts one relative to the other. So this is the Murray income re return divided by the City of London return. So all the time it's going up, Murray income is outperforming. When it's going down like now, Murray income is underperforming. Um, and the real turn here is uh, around the turn of the year when everything else turned, when basically growth started to really underperform value. Um, and that's been exacerbated since um, the invasion. So, so I'll point you on a bit, but here, yeah. So um, those conditions, I think, are probably going to stick with us for a while, but um, we'll see. There's the share price equivalent. Um, not a lot of difference. This is the income track record. I thought this is important to have a look at. So what we've got here in the purple bars are the dividends. Um, and the pink line is the revenue. So you can see that um, both had to dip into reserves to maintain the dividends in the COVID um, period. Uh, it looks more serious for City of London than for uh, Murray Income. City of London was making the point, it hasn't grown its dividend uh, by very much um, in um, this is for dividend, dividend numbers, by, by very much in recent years, but it has, uh, increased it by more than inflation over the past 10. I think that's an important point to remember too, is that even though these things are not able to match inflation in the very short term in terms of dividend income, um, that doesn't mean they can't do it over the longer term. So you have to kind of look through that as a shareholder uh, and trust that it will come right. And it has done in the past. 
Um, they've both got decent revenue reserves. So again, something that we've written about recently, um, if we are going into another period where we have recessions, where we have dividend cuts, things will get a little, little more tight. Um, they have got the capacity to keep paying these dividends. Um, they've both got really, really long track records of, of growing their dividends every year. Um, I think it's up to 56 years now, and it's, I think, the leading um, trust on the AIC dividend hero score. I don't think that there'll be any situation where they want to compromise that, so the, the dividend will keep marching up, but as I say, probably not with the pace of inflation. We had a question here about what is a revenue reserve. Um, it's not a pot of cash. Uh, it's an accounting entry. So basically what we're saying is that 9.5p share for City of London, <coughs> that's income that it's earned in previous years and not distributed as dividends. So, so because it's been earned in that revenue account, it's it's legally available for them to, to pay out as dividends in the future. So that, so it's, it's an accounting entry. Um, it's not a pile of cash that's sitting there, not doing anything. They, they're just invested in stocks and, and earning money. Um, in terms of what's been driving this, um, really, uh, it is this quality and value argument. <clears throat> so Murray Income argues that its portfolio is biased to quality and away from value, and that hurt it. Um, we have seen this with other funds, that a lot of funds that badge themselves as quality focused, and that means things with decent balance sheets, um, the strong market positions, the ability to, to pass through price increases, that sort of thing. Um, those things have been underperforming, uh, things that are value, things that were just looked inexpensive at the beginning of the period. A lot of that's been driven by energy, obviously. Energy is a big chunk of this. Um, and the fact that Murray Income is underweight in energy was one of the big factors that affected said rate of returns. Um, financials, too, ought to be benefiting. As, as rates go up, then banks ought to be making more money. Um, that's subject to them not losing it on the other side of the lending book. But that, we just have to wait and see how that turns out. Um, Murray Income is, is underweight financials relative to City of London, as we'll see in a second. Um, so, but City of London also got the benefit of having a much stronger bias to large cap stocks. And again, we although we've seen the UK market do relatively well relative to international peers, um, that's really been driven by 20, 20 big stocks. Um, underneath that, most other things have underperformed. It still um, didn't capture all of that. So it was underweight Shell and underweight AstraZeneca. Um, and it also got a kicker because it's got long-term debt, um, which looks less expensive as rates go up. Because it looks less expensive, it, it'd be cheaper to repay it early. Um, and so it doesn't have to make a provision in terms of the cost of, of repaying that early. As not as big a provision as it did do. So that added one and a half percent to the NAV. Uh, so that's that's been helpful. We haven't seen that sort of move in, in things for a long time. What we've had is years and years and years of um, funds with expensive long-term debt. And um, saying that as, as a real cost on the balance sheet, this is going the other way at the moment. Um, there's the top 10 holdings. They are quite different. They're, excuse me, they just lifted straight out the fact sheets. So they're not particularly well formatted come here. Um, I suppose the big difference is we, we said Chelsea has got more in big stuff. Um, it's also got more in tobacco, um, BAT and Imperial brands there that doesn't feature in this one. Um, AstraZeneca was an overweight here and an underweight here. Um, we know that did quite well last year. Um, they both got a bit of BP. Uh, they, I think Murray Income doesn't hold Shell actually. Um, and so that's, that's a big difference. But that, that's the sort of contrast. And here you can see it in the sectors. And again, this is not particularly useful because one's a table and one's a chart. But the big one here is financial. City London's got far more in financials than Murray Income does, um, and far less in industrials than Murray Income does. And industrials was a thing that cost it um, last year. So to sum all of this up, um, I think that in the current environment where we, we are in a recession, uh, probably now, um, rates are still coming, 
Um, the UK is not much liked by invest- international investors. I think City London is going to continue to be the winner here. Um, of course, that won't last forever. Um, and calling that change is going to be hard. But I don't think we're there yet. And so that we could see City London continue at for the rest of this year. Anyway, that's enough from me. Let's now uh, hand over to Richard for a bit. Hi. Hi. Thanks for that, Jane. Yeah. Um, so a couple of interesting stories this week from uh, supermarket real estate. Um, we had supermarket in- income REITs results and also a, um, a quite a big acquisition by LXI REIT of supermarkets. So we'll start with um, supermarket incomes results, um, which were very positive. Um, EPRA uh, NTA was up 6%. Um, which gave it a NAV total return of 12%, share price total return of 7 Its portfolio uh, portfolio value was up uh, massively. It obviously done two quite big equity raises during the year and um, and used most of that um, on acquisitions. And then its valuation on a like-for-like basis was up as well. Uh, passive rent was, was up again. And, um, and it's got a low um, loan to value, which is... Um, important at this time, but we we go on to to talk about um, its its debt structure in, in a bit. Um, but only a one percent rise in its dividend target for for next year, which um, is below what it usually it usually does. It um, increases its dividend target based on its annualised um, rental growth over the year, um, which is which is down this this time due to. Um, the economic environment we're in really i think they've been a bit bit cautious um <clears throat> and then on to the lxi's um acquisitions it, it is exchange contracts to buy 18 stores from sainsbury's itself uh, for 500 million um five percent yield which is interesting um seeing the yield sort of go out a bit uh, supermarket income reads portfolio yields at about 4.6 percent so this shows um, where yields are going. It's a sale and lease back deal, like I said. So Sainsbury's are selling the stores and will lease them back from LXI on 15-year leases with five yearly upward only rent reviews linked to CPI, capped at 4%. Um, now, uh, LXI will look to um, do an equity raise to, to part fund this and, and then um, we'll, we'll fund the rest through debt. So it'd be interesting to see what kind of um, appetite there is for this. Like I said, uh, supermarket income rate has done a couple of massively oversubscribed raises um, in the past sort of six months. So uh, we'll see how this one uh, gets away with um, with the recession looming and, and, and things like that going forward. Um, so the, the characteristics in the supermarket real estate sector are strong. Um, and especially so going into recession. Um, so as was proven during the pandemic, is core infrastructure. Um, it's non-discretionary spend. So, um, <clears throat> so that's that's that the income is 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 very strong there. Um, and then the, as we've seen over the last couple of years, um, online retailing in in grocery is as rocketed a bit like it has on in retail spend in general. And it's, it's, it's come down a bit off of its peak, but it still represents 11.1% of all grocery sales. And that's up 80% on pre-pandemic um, uh, levels. And the omni-channel, the, the, the properties themselves are, are, are really good for the supermarkets to, to give this omni-channel um, service um, they're also located very close to town centers very close to and 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 they can use them as a sort of um a pick they can use it as a warehouse effectively a, a sort of dual warehouse dual shop um and it's much cheaper for them to up to operate this than than the online only players such as Ocado, who has very few warehouses not that close to customers so um that, that's a strong characteristic as we're going forward. Uh, obviously, strong tenant covenants, Sainsbury's, Tesco's, Asda, Morrison's, all of these guys, um, which which produces resilient income for 
for for the landlords. However, there there is it, the in, interest rate rises have impacted um, supermarket income rate. So in their results, they said they've um, sixty percent of their debt was hedged at the year end, which was June. Um, since then, it's spent thirty five point three million on hedging the the, the rest of it. Um, which means it's now 100% hedged at an effective fixed rate of 2.6%, but it's taken a big hit on their um, EPRA NTA 2.8p. Um, but this is taken a hit on NAV to sort of protect earnings going forward, really, um, which I, sort, I, I kind of agree with. I only question why they, they didn't do this, didn't see this coming and do this um last year or, or, or before that but um but yeah their the, their debt is is linked to sonia which is which we can see there has, has moved up massively this year so that's why they've had to take this action the yeah, only question why they didn't do this sooner uh go on to the next slide james <clears throat> this is the impact of the last couple of days on their share price so it's traded at a pretty big premium pretty much throughout its existence, um, which is which grew throughout the pandemic as the sort of resilient nature of its income and the asset class and things like that prevailed. But in the last few days, it's really dropped off with this impact on of interest rate rises and and the recession coming up and its dividend. Um, forecast being a bit lower than expected um, but it's still on the acquisition trail um, so it's in its results it said that the um, uncertainty in the market at the moment should unlock some opportunities for it to buy at, at more attractive yields um, she said their debt is actually at 2.6 percent at the moment um, if they need to get more out it'd probably be more around the three and as we saw with the LXI portfolio, that they bought that at five percent, so there's still that sort of yield um, gap between the two, which which could be quite appealing. Um, so interesting, interesting time for that sector at the moment. Uh, I mean, the resilient income is 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 um, really attractive for me. So. Yeah, I agree. I think so. Good. Thank you very much, Richard. That's very helpful. Um, we shall now move.